Hey everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. And here by popular demand is another appearance of the moose. He's looking for little bits of bacon because that's how I get him to stay up here. Right, Moosey? Yep, so uh, Moose has a doggy daddy joke for you today, and that is, what do you call a canine from the north of Sweden? What do we call it, Moosey? A lap dog. <laughs> yeah, so good. Yep, Moosey likes those jokes too. Okay, let me get the moose down. And I got another one for you. All right, let's try this one. All right. What do you call an obnoxious reindeer? Rude off. Get it? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Well, maybe you got a laugh out of that. Maybe not. But, you know, hey, I'm a dad, so you get the dad jokes. It, this week in our research review, we're going to talk about four articles, several of which have to do with adult ADHD. And as always, you will find these articles and their hot links over in the thumbnail sketch that goes with the video, as well as a list of all the other research that I found this week on ADHD that I'm not going to cover in the video. I do want to give a shout out to one of the subscribers who kindly helped me with how to set up timestamps within these videos so that you can get to each article separately rather than listen to the entire presentation. So thank you so much for that tip. I appreciate it. From now on, I'll be uh, putting timestamps in, and I also did that all the way back through the September research reviews as well. So let's get started. First of all, we're going to talk about a large meta-analysis, and you know how much I like those a meta-analysis of all of the research on the link between congenital heart defects in children and risk for later ADHD. Uh, we've known that this risk has existed for a while, though it's not always been consistently found. Uh, in research, uh, about 1%, uh, excuse me, about one out of every 40,000 children has a type of congenital heart defect. And it makes sense that people with such defects might be at increased risk for uh, various problems that have to do with not just physical, but with mental health as well. I mean, after all, if the heart isn't functioning well, there's going to be some impact on blood oxygenation to the brain and other uh, aspects of brain functioning. And so maybe that could give rise to ADHD. There's at least some sort of link there as well. So this is a review. Uh, that shows it was based on eight studies that were found in the literature that looked at this relationship. Uh, and these eight studies, when combined, found a statistically significant increase in ADHD symptoms and severity uh, as a function of CHD, congenital heart defects. Uh, they specifically found that both the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms, as well as the inattention symptoms, were significantly increased in the group that had experienced CHD. Uh, and this was also true across the board for all of the ADHD symptoms. So the study concludes uh, that there is a strong association between having a congenital heart defect and then going on to develop uh, ADHD in childhood, and that this is also linked to the severity of ADHD as well. So uh, this really sort of uh, puts uh, uh, everything in perspective by showing that there is a robust relationship across the research studies on CHD and risk for ADHD. Now, before we jump to a causal conclusion, remember, I always admonish you guys, don't interpret a correlation as causal. While it makes sense that CHD might create ADHD as a function of the problems it's creating with the cardiovascular system and later in the brain, it's equally as likely that the genetics of ADHD also predispose toward genetic defects in heart development. After all, we know that genes for ADHD are linked to a variety of other medical conditions, including obesity, as well as diabetes, uh, as well as epilepsy. Uh, and so it's possible that there's an underlying, underlying genetic relationship here uh, that explains this correlation. So uh, again, while it seems to make sense that there's a causal relationship here, we can't use this study to make that conclusion because, again, it's not 
genetically informed in its results. So, okay, let's move on to our next one, which deals with uh, ADHD, more specifically in adults, uh, but I think this uh, cuts across uh, most age groups. Uh, and that appeared in the journal Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews. And it's a look at how often does ADHD occur in people with narcolepsy. Again, there have been a smattering of research studies out there, many suggesting there is some relationship, others uh, not necessarily finding it. So here we go with another meta-analysis. This one identified 10 studies involving 839 patients with narcolepsy, uh, and they went through and looked at the data across the studies and found that overall, 25% of people with narcolepsy qualified for a diagnosis of ADHD. That's very high. We know that the prevalence of ADHD is about three to 5% in adults, about five to 8% in kids. Uh, and so this is telling us that it's about a three to five fold increase or more in risk that if you have narcolepsy, you're gonna also have ADHD along with it. And what they pointed out is that notably, the rate of ADHD was twice as high in those who had type two narcolepsy versus those with type one. The comparison being about 46% of the former group had ADHD, about 20% of the latter group. Both, however, statistics are much higher than we would expect the prevalence of ADHD to be based on the population base rate. So uh, here we have a well-established meta-analysis showing us a well-established result of ADHD being higher in people with narcolepsy. And they pointed out that several factors could be contributing to this relationship, daytime sleepiness, fatigue, insomnia, which we know goes with ADHD, all of which impact quality of life adversely. Uh, and these were even greater among those who had ADHD with narcolepsy than those who did not have ADHD but also had narcolepsy. So it looks like ADHD worsens the impact of narcolepsy on the individual and on their quality of life. So very important finding there uh, for us to consider. Our next study actually comes from Iran. Believe it or not, Iran is doing research on ADHD. This is on adult ADHD. Uh, and it's a small but interesting randomized controlled trial of a micronutrient supplement on ADHD and ADHD symptoms in these adults. It's a pretty good study, actually. Uh, they had 52 medication-free adults with ADHD, and they randomly assigned them to getting this micronutrient supplement, which by the way, they are calling, I think it's uh, uh, the Nutrition BioShield Bio is their commercial name for this micronutrients based on uh, processing of a wheat grain supplement to extract higher doses of the micronutrients out of that grain. Uh, in any case, they assign them to receive the supplement uh, and they assigned others randomly to receive the placebo. The study went on for eight weeks, uh, and we found that uh, of the 23 participants in the micronutrient group and the 24 in the placebo group that made it all the way through the end of the study, there was a significant decrease in ADHD symptoms and an improvement in quality of life in those who received the supplement versus those who got the placebo. So uh, that's pretty interesting because as you know, there's a lot of interest out there in the popular culture about gut microbiome health, about micronutrients uh, for various disorders, including you know, autism, also ADHD, but not an awful lot of research actually being done on these ideas. But here's one such study, pretty good. The authors, I think, appropriately pointed out that Although quality of life improved and symptoms were reduced, the findings, that is the changes in ADHD symptoms would be considered small uh, and their clinical significance would be low. So this is not gonna replace medication or any other therapy for ADHD, but it might, if it's replicated, 
be an adjunct to the other more evidence-based treatments that are out there. So again, rather interesting paper from our colleagues over there in Iran, published in the Journal of Iranian Medical Council. My last study that I'm going to talk about is a comparison of a cognitive behavioral therapy program for adults with ADHD in which they took a 12-week program and compared it to a reduced six-session program, so six sessions versus 12 sessions, as to their effectiveness in helping people manage their ADHD. So uh, a very good study out of Barcelona, Spain. They're doing a lot of nice research there uh, at uh, the uh, various universities in that region. Uh, and this is a study that took 81 adults with ADHD and randomly assigned them to receive either a six or a 12 session CBT program. We know from prior reviews and meta-analyses that CBT is the most established psychological treatment for adult ADHD, obviously, in comparison to medication as well. We like to see both of them combined. It's not as effective as medication, but it is a uh, effective adjunct to medication uh, and even a standalone treatment for somebody who doesn't want to take medication. So a lot of good background on CBT and its effectiveness for ADHD. This study looking at can we reduce the number of sessions down and still get an equivalent effect. And the overall answer to that is yes. They did find that those who got the six session CBT were just as improved as those with the 12 sessions that the gains lasted up to the three and six month follow up in terms of managing uh, ADHD and other measures here, uh, including uh, various comorbidities such as anxiety and depression. So a very good study that tells us that we don't necessarily need to be doing 12 sessions to get clinical impact with patients that have adult ADHD. Six sessions seems to be enough to get the gains uh, out of this program. So I thought a very important finding there as well. So that's the research for the week. You can see all the other research over in the thumbnail sketch. Uh, and again, thank you for joining me on this channel. I hope you enjoy these weekly research updates. I'll continue to provide them for as long as I can. Uh, and uh, again, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing to the channel. Uh, and if you like the content, please recommend us to others who might have a need for it. Thanks, everybody, and be well.